Hello, everybody in Jessamine County and watching from all over the place. I'm Kate Irwin, Children's Program Coordinator from the Jessamine County Library, and we are so excited to have Silly Safaris here with us tonight. Um, we are so excited to see all the animals that they have that they're going to show us and teach us about. Looks like they've already got some fun friends joining us. Um, just a couple of announcements before we turn it over to Amazon John. Um, I'd love to have you all to, uh, like our Facebook page, check out our families uh, programming group on Facebook, and also check out our library's website for all the fun and amazing programs that we're going to have throughout the summer. There's something for everybody, and we'd love to have you join us. Also, remember that you can be logging your reading time this summer and time spent outside using our Beanstack app. So for more information on that, check the library's website. And if you have any questions about the animals that you're going to see tonight, if you wouldn't mind to enter them into the chat um, or the, the comment section on the, the Facebook, and we will answer those at the end of the show. All right, everybody, I would love to introduce you to Amazon John, who is going to teach us about all sorts of amazing animals. So welcome, John. Hey, good to see you, Miss Kate. I love this format. I know a lot of you might be thinking, oh, gosh, I wish we were live together at the library. And believe me, I do, too. But we are going to be able to do a lot of things tonight that you can't always do in the library by using our close up cameras and everything else. So even though it's different, it is going to be just as much fun. And it always is when we are at the library together reading. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Amazon John. Please don't be scared. I will not bite you if you're good. <laughs> no, I'm not going to bite you. Because we are celebrating, beloved, the fact that it is summertime and we are reading and we're getting vaccinated and oh, everything is great. And when I found out that we were celebrating Tales and Tales tonight, I had to do it. I brought just for all of you a real live moose. This is a moose. Hello. Don't moose in that. What's the plural of moose? Moosen? Meese? Don't moose have great big long antlers? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay, fine. You caught me. It's not a moose. He's a dog. And do you know what kind of dog he is? Right, a great dame. But let me tell you a little secret. He's actually just a puppy. Moose is his name. His name is Moose, and he is only seven months old. So it's a little too early to be calling him a great Dane. For now, we're just going to stick with good Dane, maybe slightly above average Dane. That's, that's what he is. But I brought him because our first tale tonight is from my favorite children's author, Jan Brett, the first dog. You see, it was Caveman who first saw wolves hunting, and Caveman said, oh, oh I'm sorry. You don't speak caveman, do you? Let me translate. Caveman said, whoa, look at those things hunt. I have got to get one of them. And when Mama Wolf wasn't looking, caveman took a puppy back to his cave, the first dog. He loved that dog so much, he found another wolf pack. He took another wolf puppy. Soon all the cave people had wolf pups. And before you know it, thousands of years later, you get dogs, every shape, size, and color. Raise your hand if you have a dog at home. Yay! <laughs> and now you know to go to the library and check out the book, The First Dog, because we love reading. And tonight, every animal has a tail to tail. I mean, they, they have tails, but of course, they, 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 they have tails too. Oh, and, and I mean that, you know, tails, T-A-I-L-S, and then T-A-L-E-S. So for this next tail we're going to share, I have an animal, but I, I got to warn you. This next animal, he, he. He's fast. Well, oh, you're so jumpy. He's a great, big, giant, super duper, very fast tortoise. <laughs> Look at that, everybody. This is a red-footed tortoise. And check him out. See what I mean? With, with Facebook Live and Zoom, we can get super duper close to him. His name is Shelby. <laughs> hey, do you know why the tortoise crossed the road? to get to the Shell station. It's in Shelbyville. He's the mayor. Whoa, whoa. I said he was fast. You don't think he's fast? Oh, okay. Okay, fine. Then watch this. 
Look at him go. Okay, fine. There's a reason that he's not fast. See, before he can even take a step, this guy has to do a push-up. He's a reptile, so he's got to be warm to be fast. But also, as a tortoise, he's a turtle that lives on the ground. And before he can even take a step, he has to lift his whole body weight off the ground. Okay, fine. Then tell me this, beloved. How, just how, did the tortoise ever beat the bunny rabbit in a race? Hey, look, everybody, tortoise and the hare. Hey, are you uh, up for a little rematch? Do you guys want to watch him race? Okay, here we go. Uh, children, no wagering. Okay, on your mark. Get set. That's cheating. Go! Go! Come on, the show's go. Yay! Okay, fine. But in the story of the tortoise and the hare, the bunny rabbit curls up and takes a nap. That's right. Hey, are you going to win anything if you're sleeping on the job? No. See, that is one of Aesop's fables. And I love Aesop's fables because they all had a lesson to them. And I know you know the moral to that story, right? If I say slow and steady, you say wins the race. Of course, tortoise isn't fast because he's a reptile and he has to do a push-up before he even walks. A tortoise is a turtle that lives on the land. I like his feet. This is a red-footed tortoise. Tortoises only eat plants and they're not swimmers, but they are great walkers. And sure, you only like the bunny rabbit because he's soft, cute, furry, and popular. I didn't even tell you the bunny rabbit's name. You want to know what his name is? His name is Foo Foo. That's right. Little Bunny Foo Foo. I know you know the song. Little Bunny Foo Foo hopping through the forest, scooping up the measly mice, bopping them on the head. <gasps> Are you okay? That bunny just bopped you on the head. If he does it again, I'll turn him into a goon. Stop that. We have to be nice. This is Facebook Live in Kentucky. Actually, when you see his feet, look at the size of that foot, beloved. <laughs> that right there is his lucky rabbit's foot. It's lucky because it's still there. <laughs> Where do you think the idea of lucky rabbit's foot came from? Probably somebody's tale that they told over generations. I'll bet you that came from the Native Americans because they were the ones that would have watched rabbits oh so long ago having to outrun Fox, coyote, hawk, even a snake. Rabbits are fast. Tortoises are not. Definitely true. But little bunny Foo Foo, that's, that's his name. You know, when you think of rabbits in great American literature, Rare Rabbit, Peter Cottontail, Roger Rabbit, Bugs Bunny, but what, Miss Kate? Yeah, great American literature. Hey, I read, okay, on a second grade level, but, but I read. When you think of all those stories, the bunny rabbit's usually the, the bad guy, right? I mean, look, do they grow their own carrots? No, they steal them from Mr. McGregor's garden. Thief, thou shalt not steal. That's one of the big ones. I think there's 10 of them or something. Anyway, I'm just saying, <laughs> maybe you want to find a book where the rabbit is the, the good guy this summer at the library. <laughs> Peter Cottontail. And, and tails. Everybody say goodbye, Bunny Foo Foo. <laughs> I love the story of the tortoise and the hare. And let me just tell you, for Aesop, that story was important for so many reasons. Aesop's fables, there's a whole bunch of them, and your librarians can help you check them out next time you go. Aesop lived in Greece, but you want to know a secret? He wasn't from Greece. He was African, and the animals that he wrote about were all animals that he watched while he grew up in Africa. He won his freedom from slavery because he was such a good storyteller. It's true, he was a great entertainer and that meant that everybody all over the world wanted to come to Greece to see Aesop and hear one of his fables. I have another one for you. This one is called The Fox and the Crow. 
Don't you love the crow? Isn't she great? <laughs> this is an African pied crow. Ah! I'm talking here. An African pied crow. Ah! It's P-I-E-D, pied. It's not because you put them in a pie. I've never eaten crow. Okay, maybe I have, but it's not the same. <laughs> hey, sometimes our tales come from the, the, the old sayings, right? Have you heard of an old wives tale? <laughs> when you eat crow, it means you have to take back something you said because you were kind of wrong. <laughs> I've never eaten crow. Not uh, Well, you know what I'm saying. This African pied crow is just like the crows that you have in Kentucky. And you'll see one of them tomorrow when you're out on your way to the library to check out books. You know where you're going to see them? On the side of the road. What do they eat? Dead stuff. It's true. You can make all the faces you want to Facebook Live, but that's their job. I like to think that every animal has a job to do, and you will always see a crow on the side of the road eating dead animals. Oh, but you never see a dead crow, do you? Do you know why? Oh, I'll tell you why, because there's always a crow somewhere close by up in a tree screaming, car, ah! car, ah! car. Ah! You know, you're telling that joke at the family reunion this summer. I know you are. <laughs> this is our favorite African pied crow. Everybody say goodbye, crow. I have to put the crow away because, of course, the story is called the fox and the crow. And I think we know what would a fox want to do to a crow? Do you think you know? Eat them. That's right. And tonight, beloved, we are going to answer a question that has been burning uh, on everyone's minds for the last, what now, Miss Kate, seven, eight years. Tonight, we find out once and for all, what does the fox say? <laughs> I know this is always a crowd favorite. Look at those ears, everybody. This is a Finnick fox. It's F-E-N-N-E-C fox. He is not a Mexican chihuahua. Oh, sorry, chihuahua. Forgive me. I'm hooked. Look at his feet. Furry feet. <laughs> like snowshoes. Hey, the Arctic fox has big furry feet. The Arctic fox doesn't want to sink in the snow. Well, the Fennec fox doesn't want to sink in the sand as he's running along the desert looking for his food. Hey, is there a lot of food in the desert? No, which is why one day in Africa, fox had been up all night hunting. He had come up empty. You know, a predator doesn't catch everything that it chases, beloved. And that fox was hungry. Morning. The sun had just rose, and uh, it was morning time. And the fox, on his way back home to get underground to go to bed, he saw it. A crow sitting high up in a tree. And the crow had a piece of cheese in its beak. Don't ask me how a crow got a piece of cheese in the middle of the desert, but it's one of Aesop's fables. So work with me, people. I was saying... That crow had a piece of cheese in his beak, and the fox, he was hungry. Oh, you know he wanted that cheese. So the fox got an idea. Have you ever heard the expression, sly as a fox? Well, that fox knew what to do. He said, well, good morning, crow, looking up and seeing the bird. What a beautiful morning, and it's made even more beautiful by you with your shiny feathers reflecting the gorgeous sunlight off your beautiful beak. Look at that beak. I bet you can sing a beautiful song with that beak. He was really flattering the crow, wasn't he? Won't you sing a beautiful song for me, you beautiful crow, on this beautiful day? And the crow was like, Oh, nobody's ever talked to me that way. I suppose maybe I, I, I could. And when the crow opened up his beak to sing a beautiful song, ah! <laughs> which isn't that beautiful, the cheese fell from the beak and right into the fox's mouth. So the fox had breakfast and off he went back to his den in the sand. <laughs> and the moral of that story is be careful of people who flatter you too much. They might just want something in the end. Am I right? <laughs> the Finnick Fox. Everybody say goodbye, Fox. Oh, but have we heard what the Fox says yet? Does he say ring-a-ting-ting-ting-ting-ting-ting? -ting -ting -ting? No, he doesn't. 
Not unless you're in Sweden after a lot of pharmaceuticals. Do you feel me? That's not rock and roll. It's not rock and roll. By the way, your library has lots of music that you can check out this summer too. And DVDs and definitely Aesop's Fables. I love the story of Aesop because it, it shows us how important one person can become. And he didn't need Facebook Live or Instagram to do it. He just traveled and he told stories. But boy, did his... Uh, um, uh, his his uh, uh, ideas, his his whole persona, it definitely grew. Hey, be honest. I want to know if you like the tortoise better than the hare. Raise your hand. You like the tortoise better? Okay. Wow, I'm seeing a few hands. Feel the love. Raise your hand if you like the hare better than the tortoise. Yeah, I knew you did, Miss Kate. <laughs> Who likes my dog best of all? See, I knew that too. Hey, I'm glad you have a favorite animal. It's good to have favorites, my friends, because having a favorite animal, well, you have a favorite book that you like to read, and I bet you've already read a few times this summer. You have a favorite song, a bestest friend. It's good to have favorites. Anybody who knows me knows I like the ones that are covered with feathers. So tonight, beloved, right there in Jessamine County, you get two birds for your show. Who knows what this is? That's right, an owl, and not just any old owl. Sometimes animals are named for their features. Um, you've got to look at the camera, buddy. This is a spectacled owl. Do you see the pretty white feathers around his eyes? They look like eyeglasses, spectacles. <laughs> Hence the name spectacled owl. And his name is Owlbert. Albert is nine years old and he's our special little guy and I love owls. Now, a lot of people like owls, but did you know that some people think that owls are ghosts, witches, evil spirits? Yeah, it's true. It's also kind of an opportunity for us to step back and read the animal. Yeah, that's right. I said read an animal. Hey, if you want to read a book, you read it one page at a time. Remember, slow and steady wins the race. So pick up a big book if you want this summer and enjoy it all summer long, one page at a time. When you study an animal, you study their features, one feature at a time. For example, you knew he was an owl the minute I pulled, pulled him close, didn't you? The minute you saw him sitting on his perch behind me because his eyes face forward. See, he flies at night. He's what you call, um, the, um, yeah, he's not a turtle. Oh, sorry. I got to get these checked. Nocturnal. You guys are so smart. <laughs> Owls are nocturnal. Oh, does that make them a ghost? Does that make them evil? No, but a lot of people think that that's definitely a weird thing, like a crow that eats dead stuff. It's funny how the way we feel about animals really does affect the way that we talk about them the way that we tell stories about them fun fun fact for you parents do you know what you call a group of crows who knows and remember your chat feature you can type it in the chat feature it's called a murder of crows so dark and mysterious just because they eat dead stuff we should be calling them a janitor of crows because we need crows do you know what you call a group of owls? A parliament. Because somewhere along the line, somebody decided that crows represent death, but owls are wise. You know why they're wise? Eyes that face forward, little downturned beak. Hey, that was my finger. Little downturned nose, round face. He looks like us, so he must be wise. We're the only culture that says wise old owl. You know what they call the owl in India? Ulu. It's a Hindu word. You know what it means? Fool. Because they think this face is very foolish. Hey, people see animals in very different ways all around the globe. But one thing everybody agrees about the owl, it can turn its head pretty far around. Can the owl turn his head all the way around like Linda Blair? See, I love how Miss K, you know, 20 something years old, doesn't laugh at my jokes. Um. Let's find out. Everybody sit up straight, face me, freeze. 
Don't move your shoulders, but turn your head as far as you can to one side and then the other. You can go to one shoulder, right? Check it out. Albert can go one shoulder over the back to the other shoulder, three quarters of the way around. And he can do that because he has twice as many bones in his neck as you do. Can you guys feel the bones in your neck? You have seven. All mammals have seven cervical vertebrae, even a giraffe and a dolphin. Owls have twice as many. They have 12, I mean 14. Hey, there's three types of people in the world, those that can do math and those that can't. With twice as many bones in his neck, this bird can see a mouse at night. But does that make him a witch turn in his head? No. Look at this feature. Do you see those claws? Look at how sharp they are. Ah, that's why I wear the gloves. They're called talons, and that's what he uses to grab his food. Do talons make him evil? No, I don't understand any of that stuff. It's just what makes this bird so amazing. All those incredible adaptations that he has that makes him a great bird. You find the spectacled owl in um, Mexico, Central, South America. In Kentucky, in your backyard, you have the barred owl, probably about the same size bird. So if you think Albert is a big bird now, wait till he flaps his wings. The, did you see that? This bird has great big wings. Wow. Hey, maybe he is wise. Or maybe I've just taught him to, you know, do his flappity things. Rings, kings, wings. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I like him just the way he is, which is why I'll never understand that tonight in Italy, an owl will land on someone's house and call, ooh, and someone in that house is going to die. If no one's home, first one home gets a sore throat. Hey, that's not what I believe. I mean, I read it in a book called The Myth of Owls, and I bet they have it at the library. Yeah, do you think that's true? An owl can do that? And yet in Britain, if an owl lands on your house and calls, whoo, and there's a woman at home pregnant with child. Do you know what happens to the baby? No worse, it's a girl. Well, now wait a second. You know that's not what I believe, right? But here's my point. People have a bad habit of going out of their way to give animals powers that they don't need. We call that superstition. And you know what? We have something a lot better than superstition, don't we, readers? We have a library full of non-fiction. <laughs> oh, it's great to check out tales of owls and other animals, the way we feel about them. Yeah, we get that from the tales that we tell. But it's also great to check out a, a field guide, right? Or, or non-fiction, because that too will help you learn about nature in a whole nother way. <laughs> and your librarians can help you. If you ever do see an owl in the neighborhood, snap a picture of it. Go to the library, check out the field guide. And from there, you can identify just exactly what kind of owl it was. You can get on the computer and with all the, you know, good old World Wide Web stuff, you can even hear the sounds, you know, that the owls make. You can do the same thing with this next animal, a great big giant slimy frog. <laughs> Look at this guy, everybody. This is Bubba. <laughs> He's so big, we named him Bubba. And here's another thing I love about Facebook Live. He really isn't a very big frog. He's growing, isn't he? Yeah. And look at him. He's got to get bigger. But if I hold him up close to you, boy, you can really see a lot of this frog. He is happy in Africa as long as it's raining because he wants to be slippery and wet and sli slimy. Hey, what are you laughing at? You're sitting in the splash zone. <laughs> hey, he wants to be slimy because he's an amphibian. And you know what that means? When he came out of his egg, he didn't look like this. He was one of those, um, um, right, a tadpole. He looked like a fish. Well, they lose their tail and they grow their legs 
and now he's an adult. But technically, Bubba Jr. here, you've seen Bubba in one of our live shows at the library. A big frog. This guy will grow to be the size of a dinner plate. But for now, he's just still a baby frog, not a tadpole. It's a new word for you today, beloved. He's called a froglet. A froglet. Yeah, <laughs> not quite an adult. I guess for us, you might say he's a, a, a toddler, right? Or a child before he's a, not even a teenager yet, right? But if he's going to get big and strong, he is going to have to do what? Eat. Yeah, which is why tonight, live on your Facebook show, we are going to play a game that is sweeping ah, the nation. I saw this on Ellen tonight. We are going to play... Will he eat worms? <laughs> Look at that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't like worms? What are you talking about? Guys, I eat worms every day. Gummy worms. I love the ones with the sour powder on them. Those are, those are really tasty. Let's find out. We're going to pretend that we are in Africa. Look at this guy. His eyes are on top of his head. So if it comes to the puddle and he can grab it and swallow it whole, he'll eat it up. He'll eat other frogs, lizards, birds, snakes, mice. All he has to do is just wait and wait and then grab it. Oh, oh sorry. Didn't mean to make you jump. So if we pretend that he is down here in the puddle, he'll see the worm walking by. He'll see the worm. They never follow the script. He'll see the, oh, you're going the wrong way. Oh, yay. Oh, hey, come back. <laughs> Let's see that again in slow motion, instant replay. You're going the wrong way. Ta-da, wow, that was so cool. <laughs> he will eat worms. Will you eat worms? One of my favorite books growing up was How to Eat Fried Worms. That's a real good one. And by the way, yes, you can get it on DVD at the library. I'd rather you read the book. But if you do check out the DVD, there is a crow in it. Yeah, the African Pied Crow is one of Hollywood's favorite trained crows. Remember those Windex commercials? Hey, Bubba Jr. started off as a tadpole and now he's a froglet, but he's not done changing. No, no, no. Would you like to see this very bullfrog turn into a prince? Me too. You know what to do. Pucker up, people. Hey, wait a second. He didn't turn into a prince, but oh, check out the smile on his face. He did turn into a very happy frog. Hey, that story of the frog prince, the princess, she turns him into a prince, doesn't he? The frog. But let me tell you a secret about that story. It's one of Grimm's fairy tales. Have you guys ever read any of Grimm's other fairy tales? Like Hansel and Gretel, right? Very grim. I think now we know where the word grim comes from. Yeah, their, their fairy tales aren't for the, the youngest readers out there, are they, Miss Kate? <laughs> no, but here's a fun fact about the frog prince. The story is actually a lot older than even the Brothers Grimm. Sometimes the best stories have a history that goes way back before we even knew of it. I want you to look very closely at this frog. You know who he reminds me of? Emperor Nero. Oh yeah, beloved. Back in the day of ancient Rome, there was a story that somebody wrote called the, the frog who became emperor because Nero, I don't know how to say this any more politely. He was a, a rounder person and he had a face that looked just like a frog. You would never say that in an earshot of Emperor Nero or you would be, be hurt very badly. <laughs> but that story is kind of an adaptation. So sometimes even you can take a story that you read at the library and kind of change it up and share it with grandma and grandpa. Give it your own spin next time auntie and uncle come to visit. Oh, going back to the Brothers Grimm. And I think your librarians all know what I'm about to say. How does the princess turn the frog into a prince? This is what I mean by adapting a story because she doesn't kiss him. In the, in the original Brothers Grimm tale, she does something else. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's very grim. I'm not going to give you the answer. You guys are going to have to go to the library 
and check out the Brothers Grimm all on your own if you want to know how she really turned the frog into a prince. Everybody say goodbye, Bubba. <laughs> Bubba ate a worm. Hey, we had dinner with a frog. How cool is that? <laughs> I have another friend of mine. And let me just tell you, Bubba, he's slimy. Yeah, you don't have to like slime, not the point. You don't have to like frogs, not the point. But you don't have to hate him either. Hate is a choice, right? Fear is a choice. You could choose to be afraid of nature or you could choose to open your mind, open your heart, or even open a book, right? That's what libraries are for. And I know what I'm talking about. Because every time I show you something soft and cute and furry, you guys all go, oh, that's so cute. Like the bunny rabbit and my puppy dog, even the owl. You want to see something else soft, cute, and furry? Yeah, you guys are going to love this next animal. She's soft. She's cute. She's oh so fuzzy wuzzy. And I know you're going to love her because everybody loves spiders, right? Uh, wait a second. I get the distinct impression that you're not turning off the computer now, are you? You get right back here, little Miss Muppet. I think some of the parents have left the room. Yeah, and that happens because I'll tell you, you're not born afraid of this stuff. Somebody teaches us to be afraid. Maybe it's the stories they tell, right? Maybe it's the, the, the folklore and the myths and the legends about the spiders. Well, you don't have to worry, readers. It's not like I would ever take the lid off. I mean, that would be crazy, right? I would never do that. And it's not like I would ever reach into here and let this tarantula crawl out onto my hand i mean that would be crazy right <laughs> but i do this for a very good reason i want you all to see and this is what i mean by facebook live if you have never ever seen the fangs of a spider up close those curvy black teeth right there oh, how cool is that if this tarantula bit me it would hurt but not from the venom it would hurt from the size of those fangs piercing your skin. But we need for tarantulas to have those kinds of fangs. Because let's be honest, guys. I mean, spiders eat bugs. So every time we step on a spider, we just make it that much easier for bugs, and cockroaches, and bed bugs, and flies to live everywhere. Oh, don't worry, guys. Cockroaches and bed bugs don't live in Kentucky. They live in Tennessee. I know I had to throw that Kentucky joke in there. Of course they live in Kentucky. They live everywhere, which is why we need to like spiders. Oh, and do you remember Charlotte's Web? Another great book. Yes, you can get the DVD, but read it. It's one of E.B. White's favorites. I, I also love Stuart Little. Check this out. He, he did write Charlotte's Web. Um, oh, be still spider. I'm going to show you something because lots of spiders make a web but tarantulas they put the webbing down on the ground and sometimes i can touch my tarantulas spinnerets and look what she'll do you can see it in the light she gives me silk do you see that she's giving us silk we found her website will you try writing script for this stuff you think your job is so hard ah! to read this summer so I can get ice cream and free books. <laughs> and along came a spider and sat down beside her and scared little Miss Muppet away. Well, you know what? Little Miss Muppet doesn't have to like spiders and neither do you, but you don't have to hate them either. Maybe you would like spiders a little bit better if you checked out Anansi and her beloved African folk tales. I know Anansi was a little mischievous, but sometimes those are the best tales, right? Anansi and her African folk tales. Charlotte's Web. There's another great book I like about spiders. I discovered this one just this past holiday season, The Spider That Saved Christmas. That's a good read if you want to have a Christmas in July party. Yeah, you can make snow cones. Never eat yellow snow. Just say no. Hey, I have another friend I want to show you, but before I do, I have to ask him. Who likes Batman? Who likes Superman? Who likes Wonder Woman? Oh, yeah, Linda Carter. I'm old school. Who likes Black Panther? Right. Superheroes and comic books, they come in every shape, size, color, too. 
but you do have to remember comic books are fiction right did you know that there is a superhero and maybe you should write a comic book about this animal oh yeah because as much fun as it is to read we can only read because someone took the time to write and tonight I want to show you a real superhero. I'm very excited about this little girl. We just got her yesterday at Silly Safaris. I'm going to turn the camera so you can see nice and close. She's a real life superhero because she's a little bitty baby possum. Isn't that great? And look at her. She can climb. They're such a good climber. I love this girl. Look at that face. I know most of the moms right now are thinking, ooh, naked tail, it's a rat. Ah, I don't like possums. And yet the possum really is a superhero. Oh, it's true. Possums are amazing. With this tail, they can hang from trees. With those claws, they hold on to their moms. At this age, they would be drinking milk. Now I have to give the possum her milk. We're going to raise this possum so we can take her everywhere to libraries all across the, 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 the country and, and, and tell them about a real life superhero because possums, they're amazing. They don't get rabies. They don't get rabies. And that's one of the reasons people love to hate them. Their body temperature is too low. The virus rabies, it just doesn't work on them. A possum every week eats over a thousand ticks. Yay. I know, talk about a superhero. That's how they look out for you by eating the mice and rats that are infested with ticks. Yeah, the numbers add up pretty fast. They eat mice and rats, guys. Oh, and check this out. A possum, it doesn't get rabies and it's immune to snake bites. In Kentucky, a copperhead, a rattlesnake, a water moccasin could bite a possum and it doesn't affect them. Talk about superhero defenses. They would even eat smaller snakes if they could find them. Possums are just the most wonderful animal. And I think you know this too, when they get mad or scared or worried, what do they do? They play dead. They play possum. I know, it's so cool. And when they play dead, I mean, their heart rate slows so much. You cannot even feel a pulse. You cannot hear a heartbeat. That's how good they are at playing dead. I've had many parents tell me a tale of their dog that brought a possum from the road back up to the front porch and everybody swears it's dead. And they go inside and they go back out with a garbage bag to you know clean up the possum and it's gone because <laughs> it wasn't dead. It woke up and ran away. Possums are amazing. And here's a little fun fact about possums. They don't hibernate. A possum only lives two years. So little Mabel here, that's her name. She, right now, she's just, uh, uh, she's only been out of the pouch for two weeks. So she's older than two weeks because they're a marsupial. They're the only marsupial that lives in the good old US of A and they are all over Kentucky. The only animal, you know, marsupial with a pouch like a kangaroo or a koala, the possum. They have their babies and the little bean looking like babies. They don't even look like babies. They wiggle up and attach themselves to mom's milk and there they, they keep growing. Isn't that something? Oh, and I see a question right there. Do possums eat cicadas? Absolutely, they do. They're going to have a great summer eating cicadas. You can eat cicadas too. I bet there are food trucks in Jessamine County that uh, I've, I've seen them on tacos. Yeah, it makes for a very noisy Taco Tuesday with a mariachi band, some sangria. Yeah, I'll come down to Kentucky for that. <laughs> yeah, cicadas are, are definitely going to be out and about this year, but possums eat bugs. They're, they eat anything they can find. And in the winter, they too have to eat lots of that stuff on the side of the road. Of course, they live in little holes up there in the trees, but in wintertime, you'll also see them like down. We give them a bad rap because, you know, they're going to climb into a sewer. They got to stay warm or underground in the winter. They don't hibernate. Winter is very hard on the possum and only living two years. Yeah, it means we've got to be much more careful around our possums. If you see a possum on the road, slow down. You don't want to hurt a possum. Everybody say goodbye, Mabel. Do they live longer in captivity? It's another great question. You guys are good. No, they don't. Isn't that weird? We have had possums that have lived one year. We've had possums that have lived three, but we've never had one live more than more than three years. They're just not, they're just not set up for that. They really are a very unique 
animal, but we keep getting them. We got this one from a breeder, believe it or not. I can't just take an animal out of a, a tree because I need to know where he came from and what, you know, all they've been exposed to. And then we uh, handle them and take them to show so they get used to everything like being at the library with all of you guys. And I know we will be back together very, very soon. Say goodbye, Possum. Possum wants to be comfortable, so I let her, I let her hide back in this, uh, this pouch. Just like, just like mom's pouch. <laughs> and this, if you ever see any of our, our silly sorry staff out and about around town, we, we put them in the pouch. It's kind of like a, a purse, and I can wear that around my head. And when I run errands, nobody at Tractor Supply knows I have a possum with me. But it's how she gets used to being walked and in the motion and everything i know miss kate is like who, who would have thunk it yep you, you might say it's my you know therapy possum i wish everybody had a therapy possum possums are amazing but i know they're not your favorite animal and tonight i leave you with one more tale and this one i know is your favorite animal because i know that everybody loves snakes right uh, oh, no, the ones that didn't leave the room with the spider have suddenly left the room. Hey, this is my favorite snake. This is called a Calabar python. It's a very sensitive snake. We've decided that we're only going to use this snake here in the Silly Safari studio in the office because they don't really travel so well and do one program after another. The neat thing about this snake is when he gets mad or scared, he balls up to protect himself. Somewhere in this wad of snake that looks like something my dog Moose left me um, is his head. What do you think? Maybe we can find it. Oh, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I found it. I found it. Ta-da. There's his head. Yes, that's his head. Uh, hello, people. This is his head, and this is his tail. See the di the. Hey. I'm confused. Which one is the head? I can't, they look just alike. Oh, oh, wait a second. Did you see a tongue sticking out from one of those? Did you? Which one is his head? Yeah, this one. You can even see the eyeball on him. That's amazing. We just played heads or tails with a Calabar Python and talk about a tail. This guy has an amazing tail because when he does get mad or scared, the head goes back into the middle of the ball and it's the tail that's left sticking up. He can wag the, the tail. Other animals will think it's the head and they will leave him alone because he looks very threatening when he does that. But of course he's hiding his head in the middle of the ball, just like a good snake would. Cause most snakes, they really don't want for us to, to, to mess with them at all. And yeah, it's a great question. This is not a venomous snake. I don't hold venomous snakes. And I love that you say venomous because something is venomous if it bites or stings you and it hurts you. So that spider I showed you, definitely a venomous spider, but not very, not very strong venom. Something is poisonous if you eat it and it hurts you. Certain berries, some types of mushrooms, my wife's meatloaf, very poisonous. I didn't say that out loud, did I? This isn't on Facebook Live, is it? You're not going to record this, are you? They are going to record it, beloved. So readers, you can watch this show over and over again this summer. They're going to leave it up as a Facebook post for a long, long time. So you can share it with your friends and share it with your neighbors and get them to take it to the library because there is a wonderful story. It's the last story I have for you tonight called The Boy and the Snake. I'm like a boy in my head anyway. And look, I'm holding a snake. This story comes to us from the Apache Native American tribe. So way out west in Arizona, right? Texas, Utah, Nevada, places like that. There was a boy in the tribe that woke up very early one morning. The sun had just begun to rise in the east in the desert. And he decided to go for a walk on his own, explore. He put on his moccasins. And as he stepped out of the teepee, the frost crunched under the leather of his shoes. That's right, it gets very cold in the desert on some nights. And as he walked along, he saw it. A rattlesnake had been stuck out in the cold the night before and that frost lay covering the snake too. Well, when the boy saw the snake, he stopped dead in his tracks. And when the snake saw the boy, 
the snake knew his only chance to live was for that boy to pick him up, hold him close, and make him warm. So the snake gathered up all the energy that he could, and he said to the boy, he said, excuse me, please, boy, pick me up. I am so, so, so c -c -c cold. Will you help me? And you know what the boy said? He said, uh-uh, you're a rattlesnake. If I pick you up, you could bite me and then I could die. Well, that snake knew his only chance to live was for that boy to help him. So he said to the boy, oh no, I promise I will not bite you. Please, you must pick me up, make me warm for if I die, who will eat the mice? Think about that for a second. The Native Americans knew every animal in the circle of life has a job. And that boy didn't want to eat mice any more than you do. Still, he wasn't too sure. He said to the snake, you promise? You promise that if I pick you up, you will not bite? You promise? You promise? And that poor snake, on what was going to be his very last breath, all he could simply say was, oh, yes, I promise I will not bite you. So the boy knelt down, picked up the snake, held the snake close to his chest, his heart, to get the snake nice and warm. Funny thing about snakes, when they're warm, they start to wiggle and move. And that's when the boy knew he could set the snake right back down on the path where he found him. Now, no sooner did the boy set the snake back down on the ground than that snake reached right up and bit him in the arm. And the boy jumped back and said, hey, what did you do that for? You said if I picked you up, you would not bite. You promised, you promised. And you know what that snake said? That snake who was feeling nice and warm and pretty happy with himself, that snake just said, oh yes, that is true. That is what I promised you. But you knew that I was a snake when you picked me up. After hearing that story, do you think Native American children wanted to run outside and pick up snakes? No, and I don't want you to pick up snakes either. Oh, I do want you to take mom for a nature hike. I do want you to find a snake. It's fun to flip over rocks and logs and things, but you definitely have to be careful. Take a camera with you. Use your phone. You take a picture. Then you can go back to the library, check out a field guide, and know exactly what kind of snakes you have in Kentucky. This Calabar python is African. You won't be finding him on a walk through Jessamine County, but you will find many more tales at your Jessamine County Library. I got to ask everybody, did you guys have fun tonight? Yay! Me too. I had so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. And Miss Kate, if you have a, any questions that you want me to answer while you got me, we're, we're live on Facebook. And yes, I do want you to keep this post up for as long as you care to, because um. I know I'm going to watch it and share it with my nieces and nephews when they come over and visit. Always fun to see you guys. Yes, sir. I think that you have been able to answer all of the questions that were posted. And so I'm just going to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Hopefully you enjoyed it and learned a lot of, like I learned a lot about animals tonight. You got to see your favorite animals, maybe learn some new appreciations for some animals that maybe you didn't like necessarily before. And so a big thank you to Amazon John and all of his friends there in Indiana. And we hope to see you back at the library very soon. Yay, we love you guys. Keep reading, have a great summer.